of our time together this weekend. I think we had a good time. I think we had a good time. Did you all have a good time? Yes, it was excellent. 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 Yes. Hi. Very good. Well, we're going to go ahead and mute everybody now, and that way we uh, can have our speaker unmute at the right time. I just want a quick announcement here. Whova is good for 90 days, which means you can continue to interact with it. You can record, review the recorded videos, which will be in the process of posting throughout the week as we edit them and edit out any speaker mistakes or you know things like that. We'll just make them look as good good as they were uh, the first time around. We uh, can keep conversations going if you have questions or comments or want to share resources that kind of came up in the chat or other things like that or ask questions. We'll have our speakers continue to monitor those. Connect with each other. Of course, if you have a, a, a question directly for any of the speakers, you, you could just send them a message and you know they'll probably ignore it because it says Whova on it from now on. But uh, I can't control everything that Whova sent out, unfortunately. Our sponsor tonight is MIEC, and we're grateful for their ongoing support. In fact, we are launching a physician's practice series with them this year, and there's going to be some great skills and other things that they cover. You can sign up on our website website for that free training. It will be virtual, but uh, we have four of those trainings uh, between the end of March and August. So feel free to take a look at that. And I just found out today that we got our contract signed for next year for 2022 at Shore Lodge. Be sure to identify yourself as an Ada County Medical Society uh, Winter Clinics attendee, and then we will be able to, you'll be able to get that discount. So uh, I know there are about a dozen people up there, a dozen doctors up there uh, this time around, but uh, we will want to fill that up next year, assuming we're good to go. So with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Tom Pintar. He is our current president, and uh, he is going to introduce our speaker tonight. So Dr. Pintar, take it away. Well, thank you everyone uh, for attending this evening. And uh, I really uh, want to express my condolences to this year's winter clinics because it was not nearly what anyone would have wanted. But with regard to that, I do, uh, I do think that Steve and Jennifer did a phenomenal job at coordinating and accessing not only the technology necessary for the people that wanted to be involved, uh, but definitely for our speakers, who many of them were remote, and uh, uh, for our guest speaker this evening. Um, in terms of our future, it's going, I'm hopeful in a very positive direction. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have been vaccinated, or at least many of us have, and with the newest uh, iteration of the vaccine uh, administration, hopefully the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine will allow for a greater proportion of our society to be vaccinated and create some semblance of an uh, end or change to our current pandemic. With that, uh, I do again want to thank our evening uh, banquet sponsor, MIC, for their support for winter clinics in this very challenging time. Uh, in addition to all of the other sponsors and exhibitors throughout the conference. Last night, I was fortunate enough to attend Steve's um, uh, uh, trivia, and it was a lot of fun. And the people that were up at Shore Lodge, along with myself at that time, really seem to be having a good time. Um, I also want to thank, uh, with extreme gratitude, the Winter Clinics Committee, who reached out uh, and were able to put together a very, I think, mindful and thoughtful conference uh, with all of the different speakers, and uh, were able to really think outside of the box uh, to provide this important medical venue for the physicians of our, of our county. Um, with that being said, um, I would like to introduce our virtual banquet speaker tonight. Uh, this is the third time in as many years that we've had the great pleasure and honor to host Dr. Salvatore Mangione uh, to the Winter Clinics uh, uh, Forum. He is a clinician educator who has uh, a long interest in physical diagnosis along with medical history. He is frequently invited to national events where I had seen him first was probably about three years ago at the American College of Physicians 
where he presented uh, very thoughtful and mindful information on the pulmonary auscultation exam with the history involved in that. And of course, that is his specialty. He uh, uh, uses his expertise in the arts and prim primarily the visual arts in his education and has been a renowned teacher of bedside physical examination. Uh, Dr. Mangione is an associate professor at the Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and I assume you're at home, Dr. Mangione? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Uh, and there he is the director of physical diagnosis and the history of medicine. He is the coordinator of the Foundation of Clinical Medicine, and some of you may remember his book from medical school, The Classic Physical Diagnosis Secrets. Tonight, he'll be sharing with us a presentation on bugs and people when epidemics change history. And I look forward to with great uh, honor and uh, uh, admiration for this excellent clinician. Thank you again for attending with us, Dr. Mangione. Thank you so much. Uh, thank Dr. Pinter and thank you, Stephen, also for making this possible. Thank you for having me back third time. So I'm going to share my screen if I can. Here we go. So do you see my slides? Can you see my slides? You're good to go. All righty. Okay, so yes, exactly a year ago, uh, of course, uh, the meeting was different. So after uh, my presentation on a Saturday, my wife and I went skiing and we found this on the road. And actually she got very close to us and it was a beautiful red fox. And she looked at us for a few minutes and then she just simply walked away. So we were pretty flabbergasted. This was uh, the 22nd of February. And at that point, uh, nobody had heard of coronavirus in the US. And so we went back and we started looking up on the web what it meant to see a fox. And according to the, set, to the Celts, if you see a fox, it means the need to quickly adapt, to employ wisdom and cleverness, and to think rapidly. And then, of course, this thing came down the pike. So I was reminded of this because, as you probably saw, uh, back in September, the UN Secretary General said this is going to be a dress rehearsal for world of challenges to come. And I bet he was referring to this. So let's talk about turning points in history. And particularly, let's talk about turning point in history that are caused by diseases. And there are two ways that diseases can change history. The first one is when they strike leaders. And I actually wrote in August of last year a paper on this, because as we saw um, in the fall of last year, there's a lot of debate on whether we do have a system in place for dealing with this, uh, particularly the 25th Amendment. So if you're interested, this is in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. But of course, what we're gonna discuss today is how diseases can change history when they strike people. So we're talking about epidemics. What is interesting about this talk is that for years, I proposed it to the American College of Physicians for their national meeting, and they regularly turned it down. And I found it kind of interesting that we were deluding ourselves that the big one wasn't going to come that we were somehow immune to it, no pun intended. So in 2018, I actually wrote a paper in uh, the Journal of Medical Humanities on how bugs can change history. And that's pretty much what I'm gonna talk about today. That paper was prompted by an interview uh, that uh, Stephen Hawking gave just uh, a couple of weeks after the election of Donald Trump. They asked him, uh, how much do we have as a species? And he said, a thousand years, top. And then he thought about it for four months and he downgraded us to a hundred years. And then he dropped dead. So he never had a chance to tell us whether we're gonna do ourselves in through a nuclear exchange, through global warming, through artificial intelligence run amok, or through a big epidemic. And I wrote it, of course, in 2018, because that was the anniversary 
of the Spanish flu. And then of course, this came down the pike. Now this picture, probably the most haunting of those taken in Wuhan was taken on February 14, 2020, which of course was Valentine day. Now that day before coming to Idaho, my wife and I were in Venice. We were there for the carnival and that's 8,500 miles away from China. And we were actually in front of the Bridge of Sighs and I was dressed up like Leonardo da Vinci and we were feeling pretty safe because that day we had read on the paper that although China had a total of 65,000 cases of COVID-19, Italy had only three and they were all Chinese visitors. Moreover, European CDC had reassured us that this was gonna be a low risk for Europe. Trump has said that we didn't need to worry about because the situation was totally under control. And of course we were safe. That day is the day that the very first patient got diagnosed in the Ospedale Civitico di Codogno, Italy, the very first patient of the Italian catastrophe. Within 20 days, Italy was in lockdown. Venice had turned into a ghost town and even the last supper had mostly gone unattended. Now here in US, the situation of course, a year later is a lot worse. We have lost so far half a million people, but more disturbingly, we lined up for guns and ammo. We watched anti-lockdown protesters resisting lockdown, anti-vaxxers resisting vaccines, and physicians asking for greater protection. And of course, we were also told the breach might have been useful. So a big mess. Well, there's another nice mess you've gotten me into. Now, this is nothing new. Osler said it clearly. Humanity has three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And of these, by far the greatest, by far the most terrible is fever. Of course, he was referring to the four horsemen of the apocalypse in this woodcut by Durer, you see clearly death with the trident. You see death stamping, uh, stamping on uh, anyone that is on its ways, the bishop, the rich, and the poor. You see hunger with scales, you see war with sword, but more importantly, you see plague with the bow of Apollo. Yes, Apollo, the god, of beauty, poetry, and medicine was, according to the Greeks, responsible for epidemics. And in fact, this goes directly back to the first great book of Western literature, to the Iliad. In the Iliad, Homer writes, Apollo came down furious from Olympus with his bow and quiver upon his shoulder, and the arrows rattled on his back with the rage that trembled within him. He set himself down away from the ships with a face as dark as night, and his silver bow rang death as he shot the arrows in the midst of them. First, he smote their mules and their hounds, but then he aimed his shafts at the people themselves, and all day long the pyres of the dead were burning. For nine whole days he shot his arrows among the people. This is an interesting passage because what he's talking about is an epidemic that involved both human beings and of course, animals. So people have actually speculated that he might have been talking about anthrax. But this issue of the arrows of Apollo eventually transmogrified in Christian iconography in the arrows of San Sebastian. And this is an important painting because it's in Venice. And you see the arrows of Apollo piercing Sebastian, but you also see next to him Rocco, Rocky, pointing to the bubo in his groin. And these were the two patron saints that Venice was hoping to use against the plague. This painting was made by Titian, a very young Titian. And you see, of course, the two saints at the feet of Saint Mark, the evangelist, which of course represents the city of Venice. And down on the left, you see the two Greek physicians, Cosma and Damian. All of this because, of course, Venice knew about the plague. If you ever go to Venice, 
that particular painting is kept at Santa Maria della Salute, a cathedral that was built in 1630 to thank the Madonna for having killed only one third of the Venetian population in that very last great catastrophic plague that uh, took place in the city. Now, the city knew so much about plagues that in 1423, they even dedicated an island uh, to the um, control of the epidemic. And in fact, that island eventually became the Lazaret, the first Lazaret ever. It was um, an area where you had to concentrate sailors, they had to ride into the harbor, and also goods. The goods were being fumigated and the sailors were isolated for 40 days. It's what, still the reason why we have the term quarantine. Venice had experienced a total of 22 outbreaks of plague between 1361 and 1528. But the one that was really devastating was the one of 1576 that also changed history. That is the one, by the way, that killed an 88-year-old Titian. And what you see, of course, is the consequences in the fact that the Venetians were unable to exploit the great naval victory of Lepanto simply because almost half of the population had died. Now, of course, we are dis dressed very differently from the physicians of that time. This is the way we dress nowadays to deal with the plague, but things haven't changed that much. Bugs still keep changing history. So the three epidemics I would like to review with you are the ones that brought to its knees the Athenian Empire, that killed the Emperor Marcus Aurelius and started the decline of the Roman Empire, and ultimately stopped the ascent of Byzantium and started the Dark Ages. And we're gonna start with Athens. The Athens of the golden age, the fifth century BC. The city has been beautified by this enlightened leader. And all of this, thanks to the victory that uh, were made during uh, the Persian Wars. So let's review briefly. The Persian Wars means that the mighty power of Persia attacks directly the divided city-states of Greece and Athens almost single-handedly saves the day. First by itself, a marathon winning a great victory. Then 10 years later, by itself, winning a great naval victory at Salamis and ultimately leading a coalition of Greek city-states and smashing the Persian army. They became the darlings of Greece. And then it went to their head. First, they struck, they struck it rich. They found silver in silver mines surrounding the city. And with all that money, they built themselves a mighty fleet, which they kept at the harbor, far away from the city, almost five miles, four and a half miles. To protect both the harbor and the city, the Athenians built long walls that made the city impregnable. And through those ships, they control a powerful naval empire, a maritime empire. This kind of upset the rival Sparta, which created a coalition of other Greek city-states and launched what they knew as the War of Greek Liberation. They all ganged up against Athens. We know it as the Pol Pol Peloponnesian War. It lasted 25 years and it brought Athens to its knees. It starts directly with an attack from Sparta into Athens and Athens locks herself up within the walls. And that's when the epidemic came. It was just a heavy concentration of populace within the walls and the arrival of the bug that did the job. So the bug came from Ethiopia, first spread north to Egypt, Libya, and the Middle East, and then eventually reached Athens by ship and arrived to the harbor of Piraeus and moved in swiftly into the city with various waves that lasted a total of two years. And by the way, most epidemics, when you look them up in history, do last two years. Now, by the third year, 
most of the Athenians got infected and 25% of the population and died. The real disaster was that the epidemic also killed the leader. And this allowed a series of demagogues to basically make some very bad decisions that eventually caused the demise of the city. Now, the source for us is not a physician. He's actually a general. His name was Thucydides, and he had actually caught the bug himself, but survived it. He wrote that the disease was so contagious that anyone who cared for the sick ended up catching it. That tells us very clearly that the spread was airborne. Now, Thucydides gets it and decides to write about it so that people in the future could know how to prevent similar problems. And in fact, to prevent similar problems to the demise of his own city, he decides to invent history. Now, the problem with Thucydides is that he's not a physician and he writes in Greek in lay language. So here is what he writes. First of all, the attack is sudden without warning and people are caught in perfect health. It starts with upper airway involvement, a headache, redness and inflammation of eyes, mouth and throat. There is a malodorous breath and then it goes down to the chest. After sneezing and hoarseness, they start coughing. And then the GI tract gets involved. They have retching, convulsions, and then they become really febrile. Now he writes, the body was neither unduly hot externally to the touch nor jaundiced, but flushed with an effervescence of small blisters and sores. That's when they get the exanthema. Now, internally, they felt so hot that they were willing to plunge into cold waters of reservoir in order to get relief. And by doing that, often they drowned. And if they didn't die at this stage of the disease, then the disease went directly down into the bowels, giving them a sort of cholera-like diarrhea, which ultimately killed them through exhaustion. If they managed to survive even the second phase, then they get some sort of DIC and necrosis of the extremities, the private parts, uh, the, the private parts, the tips of the fingers and toes, and the loss of the eyes, and ultimately involvement of the CNS. They are unable to recall their own names. They can't recognize their next of kin. So to see that this concludes by saying that the disease, which had started in the head, passed through the whole body and eventually killed one fourth of the population. So let's review, there are three phases. The very first one is characterized by upper and lower respiratory tract involvement. Then there is the GI tract and the rash. And that rash goes from the face to the extremities. And ultimately there is this cholera-like diarrhea and the DIC with involvement of the extremities and the CNS. Now, as I told you, the problem is to see that it is himself, because of course, he uses a terminology that uh, is not medical. Now, to give you an idea, it, the term that he uses for plague, loimos in Greek, it's actually any severe pestilence. But as far as the exanthema, it uses terms that could be interpreted as blisters, pox, ulcers, sores, or just mere flushing. And yet, based on what it tells us, scholars have narrowed it down to seven possible culprits. Ebola recently was suggested, the flu, but the flu is unlikely because we require a staphylococcal um, infection that makes a toxin. The plague, typhoid fever, smallpox, epidemic typhus, measles, and we can already eliminate Ebola and the flu, as I told you. So this leaves us with three major culprits. And none of those, unfortunately, has microbiologic evidence, except for typhoid fever. But even that one 
is not diagnostic. Let me tell you about it. So when uh, the Greeks were getting ready for the Olympics in Athens, they were building uh, a subway and they were doing a lot of digging and they discover a mass grave with the remains of Athenians from the plague. And they found that many of those in their teeth, in the pulp of their teeth, had DNA of typhoid. The problem is that typhoid was endemic in Greece and typhoid would not justify the epidemic. So true, true, but unrelated. Let's review typhoid. There are very few features that are common to the plague. What is particularly unlikely is the rash, which in uh, uh, typhoid is very different. And there are tons of features that are absent. So this is unlikely to have been typhoid. Typhoid doesn't give complete immunity like the plague of Athens, and moreover, would have never killed 25% of the population. So typhoid is out. How about bubonic plague? There are some features that are present, but what is really missing are the buboes. And to see that this was a good observer, he had it himself, he would have told us about buboes. How about smallpox? More features are present, but what is absent, first of all, is the description of the pox, and more importantly, the skin rash is different. So epidemic typhus, is more likely, there are more features here, but the rash is different. And moreover, what is missing is the evidence of black rats and lice from the description of Thucydides. So this gives us lowly measles as the most likely culprit. So measles killed all those Athenians. There are tons of features that fit, there is the rash, there is the upper and lower airway involvement. There is this intense sensation of heat that was described in an epidemic in the Fiji Islands in a population that was immunologically virgin and ended up having victims run into streams and rivers to relieve the heat, very much like to see this is described. Now, the features that are absent tend to be this diarrhea and yet diarrhea has been reported in some epidemics, for example, in the Fiji Islands. And yet, if the population is indeed virgin and has never experienced the virus, the virus can kill as many as 25% of the population. So at the end, it might killed all those Athenians and brought the Athenian empire to its knees. But if that's the case, we're talking about a different measles from the one we are familiar with, because that appears around the 11th and 12th century, was the ancestor of that virus. But we know quite well who killed Marcus Aurelius and started the decline of the Roman Empire. So let's talk about that. We're talking about the Rome of the second century, which is at its peak. Rome is, like the US of our times, the superpower. It is ruling in culture, in economics, in politics, and in the military. And is ruling over a war state that goes from Scotland to the Sahara, from the Atlantic to Iraq. They have a philosopher king. They have the author of the meditations. They have the one that Plato was hoping for. Remember, in the Republic, Plato writes, there will be no end to the troubles of states or humanity itself until philosophers become kings or until those we now call kings and rulers truly become philosophers. And thus political power and philosophy come into the same hands. Without it, there will be no cessation of evils for the cities, nor I think for the human race. So this is probably the only time in history when a great empire was ruled by a philosopher. And then the plague came. The plague was brought back to Rome by the years were busy in Iraq. Iraq at that time was called Persia, was the rival of Rome in the East and it had attacked the Roman empire and pen 
they attacked and took the capital of the Persian Empire and burned it to the ground. And this, even though they had promised not to burn it and not to sack it, more disturbingly, they sacked a temple of Apollo. And And the chroniclers tell us that when they entered, the pestilence issue forth, bringing death and contagion all over the empire from the borders of Iran to the Rhine River and to Gaul. So the Romans were convinced that in order to get a plague, you need to upset the gods and you need to liberate malaria, bad air, like in the case of this tomb. And that, of course, was their idea, their bias. However, in the case of the plague of Marcus Aurelius, we are relatively lucky because we have the best physician of the time doing the reporting. His name was Galen, and Galen took care of patients with the disease and writes about it. He's uh, that the disease, and this is the problem with Galen, Galen is Galen, is a sort of prima donna, and sometimes he gets it wrong. In this particular situation, for example, he's convinced that this is a fever plague, and that is exactly the same plague of Thucydides. It's not. But then he goes on to describe it, and that's where we are lucky. We have a good physician giving us medical descriptions. So here's what he says. He starts in the GI tract with vomiting and diarrhea. And the diarrhea initially was arbor and eventually turned into a melena. And all those who had lots of black stools died. So there is a GI bleed. But those that survived were the ones who had melena only later on the 7th to 11th day. In that case, they had already developed an exanthema, an exanthem, a rash. And here is where it gets really good because the way he describes the rash is diagnostic. This appeared on the ninth day. It was ulcerated in most cases and dry. No liquid oozing out of it, eventually turning into a black escar. Where it was not ulcerated, the exanthem Way like a husk. And in those with ulcers, the scab also fell away, but then the skin below was badly scarred. And this, of course, is smallpox. The first to make the connection was the best Persian physician in the 10th century. His name was Razis. And he writes a treatise on smallpox, and he says, there is no doubt the Galen describes smallpox in the plague of Marcus Aurelius. Now, current scholars, and this is probably the best paper on the plague, agree with Radzis. These are the Litmans, a classical scholar and a medical scientist. They are husband and wife, and they write, although Galen's description of the plague is incomplete, it's good enough to enable firm identification of the disease as smallpox because of the excellent description of the exanthema. The hemorrhagic nature of the exanthema and the intestinal bleeding strongly suggest that this was hemorrhagic smallpox and purporic smallpox, the most virulent forms of the disease. For instance, in Minneapolis in 1924-25, there were 164 out of 196 deaths for hemorrhagic purpuric smallpox, but only 165 out of 386 for regular smallpox. So this was smallpox and this was the worst smallpox that you can catch. Now, uh, curiously enough, this was a pandemic. In fact, we do have chroniclers from China that tell us that there were plagues at that time. And in fact, Kyle Harper even speculates that China might have been the source of that particular pandemic. And the reason for that is that they had globalization too. It was called the Silk Route. And that year, the year of the plague, for the first time, the Silk Route was open to the point that Rome and Persia and the Chinese empire 
were all interconnected. They were interconnected between la on land routes and also on sea routes. And that's why everybody came down with smallpox. The consequences were dramatic for the Roman Empire because this thing kills the emperor, kills another emperor and several family members, kills 5,000 people a day in Rome alone and goes on for years. The Litvans estimate seven to 15% mortalities, particularly in barracks. And the barracks is a problem because that means no more legionnaires. Kyle Harper estimates that a total of 70 million people were killed by the epidemic. So the military, economic, and sociopolitical consequences are huge. In fact, people have written that this might have um, um, accelerated the uh, adhesion of regular Romans to Christianity. If the gods are sending us the scourge, the thinking went, that means that we are worshiping the wrong gods and Christianity spread. It debased also the arts. Take a look at sculpture and painting at the time of Marcus Aurelius and after the plague had done its job. But more dramatically, he destroyed the empire politically. These are 28 emperors that ruled the century of death, the one of recurring plague waves, and only two died in their beds. And of course, they died of the plague. So the empire fragments. There is a Gallic empire. There is um, a Palmyra empire. And then there is the regular Roman empire. So the, sec the third century is one when the empire is on the brink of collapse. And then come a string, comes a string of strong military emperors from the Balkans. And they reorganize the army. But they have no more Roman legionnaires available. So they start bringing in Germans and the Roman army becomes barbarized. Basically the bulk is made up by German immigrants. And this will lead to the eventual collapse of the Western half of the empire within a hundred years. So the West goes, but the East is still going on. And those guys are calling themselves the Romans. They call it in Greek, oi romaioi, but they are the Romans, the surviving Romans. It's built around the capital of Constantinople, a graceful peninsula pushing into the Bosphorus on seven hills, like the original seven hills of Rome and protracted by land walls built by Emperor Theodosius. It's three rings of walls make the city impregnable and inside the best that the Roman and Greek culture could produce, all center around the Hippodrome. And on that starting gate of that Hippodrome is the famous quadriga that the Venetians will steal and ultimately take to Venice. So who's in charge? He's a young emperor, he's only 42 and 45, and he's the last of the Romans because he's from the Balkans and he speaks Latin. He will rule for 40 years and he will have a very smart woman at his side. Her name is Theodora. And the two of them beautify the city. They build the great cathedral of Hagia Sophia that Erdogan recently just turned again into a mosque. They also have a very good general and a good army. And they decide to go back and free the lost provinces in the West. It's a reconquista the last 20 years and eventually liberates first North Africa, then Southern Spain and ultimately Italy. So Justinian had rebuilt the Roman empire and then the plague came. The plague first kills Theodora who dies at the age of 48. Then infects the emperor, but the emperor survives and over a period of two years, once again, these epidemics usually run their course over two years, except that in this case, kept coming back with recurrent waves 10 to 20 years apart. 
And Justinian will be forced to see half of the population of Constantinople die and more than half of all Europeans die. And this is the result. There were no soldiers left at the beginning of 600 to guard the borders against the rising armies of Islam. All of this because of a flea and because of the European debut of bubonic plague. This is the first of three bubonic plagues epidemics in Europe. The second one will be, of course, the Black Death. So how did the bug come to Greece? It came Ethiopia. From that area, there has always been a chronic reservoir of plague, of bubonic plague. How did it come up? It came up through barges that brought from the Red Sea ivory to Constantinople. The Byzantines were making these amazing works of art that the Metropolitan Museum has a beautiful collection. And for that, they require 5,000 tons 5,000 um, uh, tusks a year, 50 tons of East African ivory. It's a big business. They have to kill 5,000 elephants every year. And of course, through the barges, they also bring uh, the epidemic. In Alexandria, ships were bringing corn to Constantinople and corn was necessary to feed the million people of the city with those ships comes the bug. The ships, however, could only travel in good season. So in Constantinople, they were building huge granaries to store the grain. And those granaries became reservoirs, of course, of rats and fleas. They literally became a perfect store. Let's review. We have plague factories, the granaries. We have expanded trade routes that bring the bug to the city, and we have armies on the march. The only thing missing is the rat. Why was there an explosion of the rat population? And the reason for that, once again, is weather. We now know very clearly that around the middle of the sixth century, there was a major cooling of the climate. Chroniclers tell us about it. John on Ephesus said, that the sun became dark and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day is shown for about four hours and still this light was only a feeble shadow. Procopius, a minister of Justinian, who's a main source for the epidemic, that the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during the holy year. And the reason for this, now we know we have scientific evidence for it, was a big volcanic explosion in the South Pacific. People actually think was probably Krakatoa. And this spewed humongous amount of soot in the atmosphere and cooled the planet. If you want to read more, this is the book about it. And very good is also Carl Harper's book on how climate and disease brought an end to the Roman Empire. So once again, that region of Ethiopia that has always been a reservoir for the plague became very wet because of the changing weather. So this recurrent flooding drove wild rodents from uh, the forest into the cities and infected house rodents. Those got into the barges and reached Alexandria. And from there it spread east and west and ultimately by the grain ships went to Constantinople. In Constantinople is Procopius and he writes, in the spring of the second year, he reached the city where I was staying at the time. People were taken in the following manner. First of all, once again, sudden fever. Some caught it when rising from sleep others while walking about. So they catch it while being essentially normal. And the fever was so languid that neither patients nor doctors considered it dangerous. Okay, so here there is a theme in Procopius. He doesn't like physicians. 
mostly I suspect because they really were powerless against the epidemic. He makes fun of them recurrently. Hence, none of those who had contracted the disease expected to die. And yet on the, some days, on, the, on the same days in some cases, on the following day in others, or a few days later, the bubo developed. So this is the lymph node of the area where the flea had bitten them. And that lymph node that drained the box became swollen. They called it bubon because typically it was in the groin. And that's the term in Greek. Remember rock, the Saint Rocco, the Rocky, the um, patron saint of Venice pointing to the bubo in his groin. But sometimes the lymph nodes that were swollen were behind the ears or in the thighs or in the armpit. And then the disease changed. Some enter into a coma or a delirium and they forgot their family members. They slept continuously. Others vomited blood and the physicians couldn't figure it out. He writes, the most illustrious doctors predicted that many would die who instead got better. And at the same time, they declared that many would get better while instead they immediately got carried off dead immediately. So he makes fun about that, but he gives us an interesting tidbit. Neither physicians nor lay person who care for the sick or the dead contracted the disease. And this is very different from the plague of Athens. This tells us that this is bubonic septicemic plague but not pneumonic plague. The Black Death will be a lot worse because we'll have an airborne spread, will be a pneumonic plague. Now it tells us that towards the end, they too develop DIC with necrosis of the distal and peripheral extremities. So then of course, there is unraveling of the society, he writes. At first, the deaths were a little more than normal. Then mortality got higher until the dead reached 5,000 each day, then 10,000 and more. Initially, each man attended to the burial of his own dead. And these they even threw into the tombs of others, either escaping detection or using violence. But afterwards, confusion and chaos became complete because slaves lost their masters and rich men lost their slaves so that many houses became destitute of human inhabitants. For this reason, some of the most notable men in town remain unburied for days. And this brought to mind pictures from Bergamo, Italy in March, April of last year when the morgues were filled and they did not know where to put them. So they stored them in the church they gave them a quick blessing and then they load them on military trucks and took them to nearby cities for cremation. Procopius writes, when all tombs became filled with the dead, then they went to the towers and tearing off the roofs, they threw the bodies in disarray and filled the towers with corpses. And then they covered them up with roofs. As a result, an evil stench pervaded the city. And during that time, it was impossible to see any men in the streets, but all who had the good fortune to be healthy were in their homes, attending the sick or mourning the dead. And if one did succeed in meeting a man, he was usually carrying one of the dead. Work of every description ceased, all trades were abandoned. Such was the course of the pestilence in the Roman Empire at large and in Byzantium but it also fell upon the land of the Persians and it visited the barbarians too. So this is a pandemic. And he concludes by this pestilence, the whole human race came near to being annihilated. The consequences are huge because of course they had just liberated the Western provinces but they could not consolidate their liberation. And the plague spread throughout Africa Europe and Asia are involved. It's a pandemic and it's a bubonic septicemic form of the plague that will come back with cycles of eight to 10 years each. 
eventually killing 40% of the population. Procopius estimates 100 million dead. And that means the beginning of the dark ages. More importantly, no soldiers left to guard the borders of the Roman Empire against the rising armies of Islam. So this was Justinian's empire just after the liberation of the Western provinces. And pretty quickly, Italy is lost to the last Germanic invasion, the Longobards. Immediately after, the armies of Islam do the rest. First, they swallow the Persian empire. Then they move quickly over North Africa, cross into Spain, and are ultimately stopped by the Franks in France. And that means that the empire of Justinian has shrunk to only the Balkans and Anatolia. And all of this because of Yersinia pestis. How do we know that this was Yersinia pestis? Because we were able to retrieve it from the pulp of teeth of victims dug in England of all places, victims of the pandemic of Justinian. So let's review how bugs can change history. I've told you about the plague of Athens, the plague of Galen, and the plague of Justinian that brought an end to the Athenian, the Roman, and the Byzantine Empire. But of course, bugs kept coming back. The Black Death ended feudalism and started the Renaissance, at least in Western Europe. Feudalism ends in Russia during the American Civil War but in Western Europe ends with a Black Death. That was actually a good thing. Then there is the Colombian exchange, which means we gave um, Native Americans measles, smallpox, malaria, and TB, plus the Spaniards and guns and steel in exchange for syphilis. Syphilis might have even led to the Protestant Reformation. Remember, syphilis blows up in Europe through Italy, where the Spaniards are trying to conquer Naples, and the Spaniards are sick. They infect the Napolitans. The Italians blame the Spanish. They call it the Spanish disease. The Spaniards blame the Italians. They call it the Italian disease. Then the French come down with their king, and they're French, so they get really sick. The king almost dies. So Italians and Spaniards get together and say, let's call it the French disease. But that French army was mostly made of German mercenaries that go back to Germany without their hair, without their nose. In secondary syphilis, the consequences were devastating. And that's when Luther says, let's split. Even the Pope in Rome has syphilis. Napoleon sold Louisiana to Thomas Jefferson, not because he liked the US, but because he hated all those yellow fever epidemics they were killing his soldiers in Haiti and Louisiana. And Napoleon was stopped in Russia by typhus, not by the Russian winter. Napoleon conquers Moscow by September, and that was relatively warm. But by then, he had lost already three out of four of his soldiers. Finally, typhus and the Spanish flu end World War I. So what are going to be the consequences of COVID-19? We don't know. What we know is that the Chinese have an interesting term to way to write the word crisis with two pictograms. One means danger and the other one means hidden opportunity. So what's the hidden opportunity of COVID? Well, the silver lining might be that this in the end is the great leveler. There is no doubt that overall, the billionaire in the penthouse and the guy in the streets are as susceptible to the bug. Clearly, if you read our literature, you realize that there are still racial and economic determinants of who gets the disease. But in general, epidemics have been the great leveler. So for example, feudalism came to an end with a black death. And people have already said that maybe the great discrepancy in wealth that we are currently living in will come to an end because of COVID-19. There is another possible silver lining. This is the first time that we are really facing a global danger. 
there is no doubt that the virus has all the world in his hands and we are all in this together. So will we be able to develop a global mentality? Chancellor Merkel on May 18 said that the nation state alone doesn't have a future. And frankly, she's saying nothing new. JFK had said it 60 years earlier. He said, We all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future and we are all mortal. So will we finally realize that viruses respect no borders, but more importantly, global warming respects no borders. And I'm saying this because last year I got a kid in March, a grandkid, and now my daughter decided in the middle of the pandemic to get pregnant with twins. So I have an interest at stake. And there is another reason why I have a conflict of interest. I own a house in Venice. And if you don't believe in global warming, this was our neighborhood in Venice in November, 2019. But it's not only Venice, it's gonna be New York, it's gonna be Miami, it's gonna be San Francisco. So is this indeed a dress rehearsal for problems to come? There is even some evidence that the spread of the bats that was the reason for the development of the epidemic might have been facilitated by global warming. So the hope of course is that this virus is a reset button and there was some promising evidence Carbon emission dropped by 17% last year to the point that in India, they were finally able to see the India Gate. In Venice, you were able to see finally fish and uh, swans in the lagoon. And in Constantinople, dolphins came back into the Bosphorus and goats started roaming the streets of a Welsh town. So is it possible that maybe this told us that the earth is a common being and we need to develop a global society idea and not go back to our division of nation states. For that, we'll need a lot of critical thinking. And that is a bit of a problem nowadays. This is a very interesting book that Carl Sagan wrote 25 years ago before dying. He wrote about science as the only flickering light that we have against the darkness of superstition. And he wrote those words. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries when awesome technological powers are in the hands of very few. No one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. When people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what is true, we slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness. You know that 25 years ago, and Martin Luther King put it simply, the only reason we go to school is to learn how to think critically. And yet all, more than half, almost half of college kids can't think critically. For us, Hippocrates put it simply, there are only two things, science and opinion. The former begets knowledge, the latter begets ignorance. And we have seen it, of course, with a big debate about face masks, which a hundred years ago, nobody minded. This is a picture from the Pacific Northwest, wear a mask or go to jail in 1918. So I hope that everything will change, but I also know that sometimes everything has to change so that everything can stay the same. And if that's the case, maybe 
we really want to learn from this. There are some, some clues already that then major drop in emission has come back to normal. So if that's the case, I think we should start becoming comfortable with the bright side of human extinction. This is a poster I bought in Venice from this artist and I keep at home. And I think unfortunately she's right. In the end, only time will tell. But this would be such a missed opportunity because epidemics can teach us a lot. And I only hope we can listen. So that's my joke. Um, it's uh, an hour. Um, and I'm going to stop screen sharing. And I'm going to give it back to the host. Let's see if there are questions. Open up the chat room. All right, uh, very good. We will let everybody go ahead and unmute themselves if they have a question. Perhaps if they raise their hand first, we can call on them in order uh, because I'm sure that there's a lot of questions. So. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can wait and uh, then jump in boldly. Yeah, maybe the best thing is to just ask questions directly because it may make it easier. So if you have any questions, just unmute your microphone and uh, speak. Mike Weiss. Yeah, I have a question. This this epidemic seems different in that it seems to affect old people so much more than young people. Do you think that will have consequences to how it affects the world? Well, well yes. Yeah. Uh, remember last year, the young people were joking about boomer remover. Um, so yes, um, this might be, I think, a problem in the sense that yesterday I went uh, to get some uh, barbecued wings at our local tavern here. And there was a big sign outside that says, can't come in without a mask. The tavern was jam packed. The only three people with a mask were me and the two waiters. And everybody else who was young was without a mask. So that has been the major consequences, both here and in Europe. Part of the problem uh, linked to the second wave was that young people did not take precautions. There is no doubt about that. Um, the Spanish flu killed young people. Um, so, the, um, so that in, in, what you're pointing out is correct. Uh, but I think for us, this has been a problem because we have an entire chunk of the population that thinks that they are invulnerable and, and they, they, they have caused problems. So what do you do with those folks? There is another issue I think that I would like to bring up and the, both the JAMA and the New York Times had articles on that. Um, as physicians, what do we do with fellow physicians that spread news that are medically unfounded? Like for example, their masks are not protective. Should we reprimand them? Should we censor them? That's a big issue. And um, I don't think we have seen much of that in the past year. Um, I just recently wrote a paper with uh, our dean uh, that is out for uh, review on the fact that last year, uh, actually this coming year is gonna be the 200th anniversary of the birth of Rudolf Virchow, the guy who invents pathology, but also would have been the 100th birthday of Bernie Lowen. And if you read the news 10 days ago, Bernard Lowne passed away in Boston at the age of 99. Bernie Lowne is the guy who invents the defibrillator, doesn't make a penny on it because he refused to patent it. He wanted people to have access quickly and freely. And then went on to win a Nobel Peace Prize for co-founding physicians for social responsibility and against nuclear war. I was lucky enough to spend three days with Dr. Lown in 2017 because he had been the mentor of my dean. And I knew about Lown, of course, a lot, and he knew how much I respected him. So he took me to Boston to meet him, where probably the most inspirational days of my life. But this guy had no doubt 
that we need to be socially involved, that we have the medicine comes with social responsibilities. So I think that's another thing that, at least for me, and it's something I put in that paper, COVID taught us. What, what are we? Um, I've been struggling with this issue. What is a doctor nowadays? They're calling us providers. And I think the reason why they're calling us providers, of course, is because they remove certain features that were traditionally present in the profession, which I really think should be rediscovered. One is this idea that we have social responsibilities. So maybe COVID has taught us that. And of course, if you read the news, you saw that some of us um, did follow those responsibilities, but should have the profession follow them more. So I think the epidemic uh, is a work in progress. I have a paper I wrote that just got published uh, and I'm gonna send it to Stephen Reams because it was called the moral lessons of COVID-19. Uh, and I boiled it down to three major topics. And I wrote it uh, with the director of ethics at Stony Brook University. Um, I think um, we are going through a change and it's hard to predict what this change will do. Um, but I do believe that as physicians, we do have a responsibility. And we can send that out to everybody if you uh, forward that to me, is that okay with you? Absolutely, I'll send it. Uh, very good. Well, we're waiting for somebody else to unmute. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Andrew Gruber. What do you think was the major cause and purpose of creating a political division in how to deal with the academic? Were these divisions common during other pandemics? Great question. Well, that's the thing. Physicians are, by definition, apolitical. You know, we're, we are the ultimate citizens of the world. There is a beautiful story. Um, uh, behind the Bernie Lown uh, Nobel Prize ceremony. So here he is, he's a cardiologist, he invents the defibrillator. The other co-founder is also a cardiologist. They, they do a press conference and uh, a Russian journalist drops dead during the press conference. Good time to drop that, surrounded by 22 physicians and inventor of the defibrillator. So they resuscitate him. And immediately Lown went on the attack. This shows, he says, what physicians do. We don't ask you your political beliefs. We don't ask you your color, your religion. We immediately intervene to help out. And we he added, we work with physicians all over the planet to help our endangered home. Also used to say there are no distinctions of nationality, creed, religion, or color under the portals of the temple of Esculapius. And that's why I think we do have a responsibility. So the question that this uh, physician or person I don't know asked uh, is very correct. Why politically they use this to divide us? Physicians should have reunited us. And I, I would have liked to hear the physician's voice a little bit more. Uh, I'm actually not a physician. I work in insurance, so I, that's why I want to pick your brain on this end of it uh, and see what where you thought the political division came from. Yeah, what's going to happen to yeah, what's going to happen to health care as a result of the epidemic? It's a good question. Um, it's a good question. World War II, and of course, the disaster of World War II was the reason behind uh, the National Health Service in England. Um, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, I don't know. So what a, I think the goal of this little talk was simply to say that these are big things. Um, they are big things because even though this epidemic in the end will not kill the 50 to 100 million people that the Spanish flu killed, um, it does, it did kill a certain way of living, I think, that we took for granted. And so it's difficult to predict what the future will be. But I would like to see physicians at the forefront. Um, last time I checked, uh, in Congress, there are only 2% of Congress folks that are physicians, 40% are lawyers. And I would like to see more physicians involved than lawyers, personally. I'll feel more comfortable with physicians making decisions. We have a question from Dr. Lewis. What shifts in health delivery systems will be needed to manage future pandemics? 
Uh, I wish I knew. Definitely not the ones we currently have. I mean, we failed pretty badly, didn't we? The good news, or at least, you know, uh, Schadenfreude news is that many other countries also have problems. And what I found depressing is how everybody was there for himself or herself or itself, which means nation against nations. This was really a way to come all together. And uh, we failed it. And since um, the UN Secretary General, I think, got it right when he said that this is a dress rehearsal for problems to come, uh, that is not enough to make us optimistic about the future. And problems are coming. So again, all of this to give you my bias. My bias is that physicians are and of right ought to be the natural attorneys of the poor. And I'm quoting Rudolf Virchow, who called us the natural attorney of the poor. Virchow believed it. For 25 years, he got elected to the Reichstag and made uh, Berlin a model city. He was so liberal that he got challenged to a duel by, by Bismarck. And uh, the story is that he says, uh, I'll fight you as long as we do it with scalpels. And of course, there was no fight. But again, I would like to see us more involved. So what is the future? I don't know. But I don't think it's going to go back to business as usual. I think it's going to be different. Dr. Carswell asks, so uh, again, why do you why think we're that we're called providers? providers? You see that, great. Um, yeah, I actually, uh, I hate that term. Particularly, I hate it when uh, I hear it from uh, students that call themselves providers. Um, I think what they're talking about is reducing us to mere health technicians. Are we physicians, health technicians, dispensers of pills? people that do procedures, or are we something more? I think uh, I gave last year a talk on the archetypes of medicine, wasn't it, Stephen? That's um, correct, yeah, last year. So I think we are a little bit more, and when they call us providers, they reduce us to technicians. So I, I do have a problem with that. Well, with that, then I might call on Dr. Tom Pintar to go ahead and unmute himself and show himself and just allow him to close us out with any final thoughts for the evening before we let everyone go. Dr. Mangione, thank you very much for that uh, extremely um, mindful and illustrative discussion and especially the discussion afterwards with the questions and answers. Uh, you know, we as physicians, you're exactly right, are the deliverers of care and humanity for the patients that we serve. And I think that's often, all too often forgotten. Um, we greatly, greatly appreciate you and your time and expertise and efforts to meet with our uh, local medical society and its attempts at uh, educating our physicians. And we will hopefully look forward to seeing you in person next year, if at all possible. We love, love that. And, and, and thank you so much. I really, I appreciated the invitation quite a bit. It was nice to see you all, yeah. Well, thank you again. And Stephen, thank you. Um, I think this was an excellent forum this evening, and uh, hopefully all of us that were able to attend got a lot out of it. I look forward to listening to the presentation again. Very good. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you uh, pitching in to be a part of our Winter Clinic success this year. Next year, we'll be back up at Shore Lodge, I hope. And with that, we sign off and uh, wish you good night and good luck. Thank you all. Stay well. Thank you. Stay well as well. Thank you.